study uh, in a different part of the world, and uh, we're going to hear uh, from Joe Beale, the Professor of Development uh, Studies uh, at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Um, hello, I'm going to talk to you today um, okay, uh, about Johannesburg. Um, jo Johannesburg has undergone a big transition, as all of you know. Um, it's just over a decade since that transition began with the first democratic elections in 1994. Um, so enough time has elapsed to begin to assess progress made, even though the process of transformation from apartheid planning is far from complete. Some would argue that uh, Johannesburg's experience is so unique because of apartheid that it's very difficult to learn lessons elsewhere. But I would argue that um, many of the problems that Johannesburg faces now uh, are very similar to cities all over the world, including Mumbai. Problems of uh, resource constraints, social inequality and social differentiation, bureaucratic inertia, and so on as well as um, high political expectations. So it offers some useful uh, lessons for people who are trying to transform planning under conditions of change and transition. But I think it is important to say something about that apartheid legacy. Uh, like most big cities in South Africa, Johannesburg is physically divided, with the poor living to the south of the city uh, and the more affluent to the north and center, and with people uh, who are especially poor living in informal settlements on the peripheries of the north and the south. The poor are predominantly black, 70% of the poor are black, and uh, of the population um, is, is black and poor, and the majority, although not exclusively um, uh, white, uh, amongst the more affluent. What makes apartheid's legacy different from spatial segregation, which is in fact quite familiar to uh, many countries that have had, say, British uh, colonial pasts, is that in addition to um, spatial segregation, you had racial seg segregation extended to discrimination in almost every aspect of life. So what the new government in Johannesburg had to do was to cope with uh, both physical hierarchies uh, based on race and racially defined provision. Today, um, the legacy that was inherited was one of 20% of the uh, most people in most abject poverty living in informal settlements without basic services and another 40% of the city's population of Johannesburg living in inadequate housing in the former black townships. Uh, and this in a city where despite having higher than national average growth levels, has a 30% unemployment rate. So these figures underscore the monumental uh, service delivery challenges of the city. The political and policy challenges um, rested in the fact that, this, that uh, under apartheid, the city had 11 different local authorities, uh, seven white authorities that were 90% self-sufficient and which spent 60 US dollars per capita um, and four black local authorities that were 10% self-sufficient and spent only 10 US dollars per capita. So one of the first things that um, the new ANC-run council did uh, following the 94 elections was to um, campaign under the slogan of one city, one tax base in order to effect redistribution at a city scale. Um, the uh, governance structure that resulted was four local authorities um, instead of 11, uh, and they have some degree of um, autonomy and power, and a single metropolitan um, council uh, above this with um, an executive mayor. What we're particularly concerned about with, uh, in this session is uh, the challenge that Johannesburg faced in overcoming um, the inequalities of spatial segregation. Um, these included the poorest uh, people in the city having to commute long and expensive distances from peripheral apartheid settlements into places of work. Uh, 
in order to um, begin to affect changes in the city, the um, national government put forward a model of developmental local government. Um, this was protected constitutionally, um, and all activity and planning at the municipal and metropolitan level comes under uh, the constitution which protects the basic needs and rights of poor people and which insists on participatory as well as electoral uh, democracy. So, um, what we find is a system of integrated development planning that aimed to rupture the structure plan tradition of apartheid, to bring in more collaborative planning. Um, and this was uh, introduced in, in a way that all cities had to put forward their visions, their priorities, identifying the needs of the most disadvantaged citizens in uh, the city, and, um, and to consult widely in a participatory way. This, this was a valuable process. It was a process that was tied into a three-year budget cycle linked to the political system, and it constituted an aggregation of community-level uh, planning and um, priorities. But there are some tensions between this and Johannesburg's ambitions as a global city and the need to plan beyond three-year political cycles and to have a longer-term horizon. So one of the critical um, tensions that, that Joburg, Joburg represents is this tension between the domestic uh, and political imperatives of the IDPs and the longer-term horizons and visions of uh, many other interests in Johannesburg. Um, What's also important to recognize is that Johannesburg is part of the province of Gauteng, as you see in the map. Um, and Gauteng province is the economic heartland of South Africa. Its own growth strategy called Blue IQ sees uh, Johannesburg and Gauteng as, as um, leading uh, the economy through high value added manufacturing projects and technology projects, big mega project investments. And this, in turn, sits in some kind of tension. Um, Johannesburg's mayor, Amos Masondo, has tried to bring together some of these agendas, for example, in his inner city regeneration initiative um, represented here in the visual by the Mandela Bridge, uh, which is trying to bring investment back uh, into the city center, trying to bring uh, poverty reduction and job creation agendas together with regeneration agendas. So what are the key uh, planning challenges in contemporary Johannesburg? Um, under conditions of transition um, and uh, unemployment and political demand, um, there is a big challenge of public security and safety. Uh, a huge challenge, as you can see in this picture, is um, growing informality, not only in economic activities, but also in housing and uh, service, production, uh, uh, service provision. Um, as you see here, the city has attempted to uh, stop uh, informal street traders with very little effect. Um, but there's another big challenge which relates very much more to what we've been talking about um, uh, in this session more generally, which is um, attention in, in, uh, with regard to spatial planning. The aim was integration, the integration of the city through compact city uh, models, um, mixed use, um, increased density, and so on, and joining up uh, parts of the city through uh, transport corridors. But there's been a mismatch between uh, the idea of the compact city and mixed use and the imperative of delivery. So what you had in Johannesburg was target-driven, numerical target-driven delivery, the most well-known example of which is the Million Houses campaign. And in order to deliver to scale, uh, to economies of scale, you had to deliver on the periphery of the city, where people who are poor and black already live. 
And so you have a contradiction in the uh, planning white paper between an imperative for land use which should, should promote efficient, functional, and integrated settlements on the one hand, and another imperative that land use and development should be determined by the availability of appropriate services and infrastructure. And what you have in, um, in effect is engineers and planners on the ground having to make it up as they went along as there was an attempt to try and coordinate in very much similar ways to, to which previous speakers have, spoke, have talked about, trying to coordinate spatial planning imperatives, transport planning imperatives, and um, compact city imperatives, and not very successfully. So if I can just illustrate it briefly in the last uh, couple of minutes uh, that I have with, a, with reference to transport planning. Post-apartheid transport planning aimed at integrated cross-modal system with um, an emphasis on public transport that was affordable, uh, that absorbed less than 10% of people's disposable income. This was particularly important to bring into the city, into public space, into workspaces, people who had been previously excluded and people who, uh, through no fault of their own, had to live on the widespread periphery of the city. But um, what you have uh, is something that didn't quite work out that way. Um, there has been an increase in Johannesburg uh, of public transport, but you've also had an increase in the use of the private car. Um, the subsidy system, which I haven't got time to go into, meant that affordability issues haven't been addressed and that it's 10% of total incomes that people um, are having to spend on transport. And this particularly affects the poor. Um, in a 2003 survey, between half and three quarters of users in Johannesburg were dissatisfied with rail, bus, and minibus taxis for reasons of overcrowding, travel times, personal security, vehicle roadworthiness, off-peak uh, frequency of service, and proximity of ranks. And this, in many ways, represents a crisis in delivery. Whoops. If I go um, back to looking at some of the governance issues underlying this crisis. There are tensions between ensuring this affordable transport and the goal of um, achieving a globally competitive, outward-oriented economy. And these tensions can be seen in the tensions between the IDP and the city development strategies. Um, because spatial planning hasn't been um, sufficiently integrated, into the IDPs, it's left a lacuna that um, has been filled by iconic or prestige projects such as the Gauteng Rapid Rail Link, which arguably has distorted and displaced more appropriate uh, investments in transport. But the most trenchant failure, and this relates to something Tony was talking about earlier, is the failure to have uh, formed transport authorities. Uh, a confusion as to where responsibility for this should lie, so that uh, the metropolitan government is unwilling to take on what they see as an unfunded mandate, um, and without a clear local authority structure for transport, there's been a lack of uh, ownership uh, of this at, um, at city level. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much, and I hope it's been instructive.